I'm now going to invite Hayley and Kathy up for the Bible readings and then Sal will be bringing the message. Uh, Genesis 12, verse 1 to 9. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah, and Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Thank you. Uh, the next reading is from Matthew 9, nine from verse 9 to 13. Uh, it's the entitled The Calling of Matthew. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was dining at Matthew's house, many tax, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. And this is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I ask of you this morning that anything that's written on my paper that's not from you will fall on the ground. But every word that is from you will reach our ears. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Um, if you've read Bob's little thing in the newsletter, I can say amen and go and sit. <laughs> I think he has um, said it very well, better than I have, but let's see where God's taking us. Now, we all love our comfort zones, don't we? Um, because why would we step out of what we know and where we feel safe to do something that we are not so sure of? And we live in a society where so many, many people suffer from anxiety. And I think we feel anxious when we try to do something that, um, that's different from what we normally do. Now, when I was a chaplain in the school, I used to read a book to the young kids called Hey Warrior. And 
and it was a book about anxiety. And this lady, now I can't remember her name, her last name, I know her first name was Karen. And she, at the end of the book, said to the kids, um, now go and take your brave and conquer. And she said that anxiety and bravery always go together. Because for us to do that thing that we are scared of, we have to be brave. Now, if we look at Abraham, <laughs> Abraham I wonder whether back in those days they had anxiety too. They probably didn't know that that was it. But here yeah, God is telling him to um, just go. God didn't come with a 10-point plan. He, they didn't draw up a step-by-step -step direction, and they didn't debate about it. God told him, and Abram did what God told him. It came with an amazing promise that God will make him a great nation, a blessing. His name will be great, and he, Abram, would be a blessing to those around him. God will bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him. All the people of the earth will be blessed through him. I wonder if Abraham felt anxious. He was about to take his wife, Lot, all his possessions, and go to a land God would show him. Now, when we immigrated, I mean, that was a, a big step. But we didn't do it without first coming to the land and checking it out and make sure where we're going to live, etc. Abraham didn't have that opportunity. I wonder, did his family, his friends, the people in his neighborhood try to talk him out of this crazy idea? Did they think he lost his marbles? I don't know. All I do know is that the Bible tells us Abraham obeyed God. He took all of these people and he moved, even though he was 75 years old. Now, guys, I was 37 when we immigrated, and it was a big thing for me. I can only imagine how difficult it must be to take up your roots at 75 and move to a different place. In the Matthew reading, we heard in verse 9 that Jesus saw Matthew the tax collect at the tax collector's booth and said to him, follow me. Matthew got up and he followed him. There wasn't an executive meeting and a discussion about it. He simply got out of the booth and followed Jesus. The Pharisees were indignant. How could Jesus not know about Matthew? My goodness, he was a tax collector, a cheat, a crook, and a traitor, working for the government that they hated with such a passion. Of course, Jesus knew about Matthew. He knew Matthew didn't have a squeaky clean reputation. I love the way in which Jesus answered that it's not the healthy who needs a doctor, but the sick, and that he came to call sinners, people like Matthew, people with a past, people who messed up, people like me, and maybe people like you. Now, this morning, I want us to look at a few people that God used, called and used despite their weaknesses. If we look at Abraham, Sometimes he got it right, but sometimes he got it wrong. When they got to Egypt, Abraham was scared that they are going to kill him to take Sarah for, her, for his wife because she was quite a good-looking lady. So he told her to tell everybody that she's his sister, not his wife. Um, later on, when Sarah didn't conceive, 
Um, and they were getting older, and physically it just seemed impossible. He fathered the child with Hagar, who was Sarah's slave, and Ishmael was born. This didn't disqualify him from being used by God, even though it made life for him, Sarah, Hagar, and their people quite challenging. We still today see the effects of the friction between Ishmael's descendants and Isaac's descendants. Do we always trust God's promises? even when it takes a long time for them to be fulfilled? Or do we try to help God and in the process mess it all up? David. David is known as a man after God's own heart. We get to meet David as the shepherd boy, the one who killed the giant because he trusted in the name of the Lord. The one who refused to kill Saul. Oh, not Saul. Yet Saul, when he had the opportunity. Because he trusted God to make him king when the time was right. He started out so well. But then, when his people went to war, King David decided to stay home. And staying home put him in a position where he saw another man's wife. And he's the king, and so he got them to bring her to, the, to him. He slept with her, and when she sent him a message that she's pregnant, he tried to cover up by getting her husband to come back from the, from the war and sleep with her. And when her husband didn't do that, David got him killed. He didn't discipline his children. And his family fell apart. Amnon raped Tamar. And Absalom then devised a plan to kill Amnon. David confessed his sin. He ran to God. He asked for forgiveness. And we know him today as the man after God's own heart. So many of the Psalms today, or that we use in worship today, were written by David. His failings didn't disqualify him from being served, used by God. I think the message we can learn from David is run to God when we mess up. Peter. Now, here is a man who walked with Jesus. He was in the inner circle. He loved Jesus unreservedly. He passionately declared that he would follow Jesus even into the grave. When Jesus washed their feet, Peter said, no, 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 get up, you can't wash my feet. When Jesus said to him, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have part of me. Then Peter said, oh, in that case, please wash my hands and my face and everything. Um, but, uh, no, so sorry, he didn't do anything half-heartedly. On the night when Jesus was arrested, he sliced off the high priest's servant's ear in his passion to defend Jesus. But then, only a few hours later, when the pressure was on, he denied that he ever knew Jesus. Not once, but three times. He was so disappointed in himself, so disheartened, so ashamed of his behavior. Have you ever been there? Have you ever fallen flat on your face? Have you ever wondered whether Jesus can forgive you another time? Give you another chance? The answer is yes. He reinstated Peter, 
telling him to feed his lambs, to feed his sheep and to take care of his sheep. He's also asking the same of us. If we've never failed, we cannot have compassion on those who struggle. But when we know how hard it is not to do that thing that we hate to do, we can come alongside them and feed the sheep, take care of the sheep, and feed the lambs. What can we learn from Peter? Even when we fall flat on our faces, God's grace is greater than our worst mistakes. And he reinstates us and use us and our failings to bring others into his kingdom. Let's look at Paul. I love Paul's journey. He was a very well-educated man, a Pharisee, understanding the scriptures and the mindset of those who, who would oppose him. Yes, we are introduced to Paul when his hatred for Christians reached the peak. He would do anything in his power to eliminate this sect. But one encounter with Jesus, and he is a new man. His former spiritual blindness gave him compassion for the lost. He knew what it felt like to be deceived. God used both the good and the bad experiences in Paul's life. And he can do the same for you and me. Now, on Saturday, when Mark asked if um, Bob or I could, who could preach today because Francis had to go to hospital, um, and I said, yep, I'll do it. I didn't know what the lectionary readings were. But since Saturday morning, in my Word for Today devotional, the theme was, God is calling you. So for three days, this writer of the Word of Word for Today was following this theme of God is calling you. Would that be a coincidence? I don't think so. So the theme went on until Monday, and I found lots of ammunition for my message today. Um, now, all jokes aside, the word for today, in the Word for Today, uh, they talked about Paul and how God was using him. The writer said that Paul was perfect for the job God had for him, to write down the theology of the church, to debate the religious lead leaders who argued against the church, to advance the cause of Christ in academic and social arenas, to carry the message all the way from the lowest person on the street to the throne of Caesar. Paul already had the necessary qualifications. This is how God works. First, he seeks you out. Then he prepares you. Then he positions you. And then he empowers you to do what he knows you can do most effectively. Now, the last person that I want us to look at is ourselves today. Jeremiah 5, four, sorry, Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says, Before you were born, I sanctified you. The word sanctified means to be set apart for exclusive use. Now, if you forget everything else, remember today, God doesn't waste anything he created. And he doesn't waste anything he can use. Even before you were saved, God allowed certain experiences, good and bad, that were equipping you for what he had in mind. This includes those things that are, that are inside you that probably got you into trouble when you were younger. Those things that you thought counted against you. Your refusal to give up. Some may say you are stubborn. Your passion for justice. Some say, I just tone you down a bit. Your 
ability conf to confront a problem head on. Some think, oh, you're a bit stupid. All of these character traits God can use to establish his kingdom here on earth. Today, you may feel you're in the wrong place, doing the wrong things with the wrong people. You may wonder how you are going to dig yourself out of the hole or turn your life around. And to be quite honest, we probably cannot. But we serve a God of miracles. He can do what seems impossible to us. All he asks of us is to give him all of it, warts and all, and say, Lord, here they are. I wish I made better choices, but I didn't. I wish I could clean up my act before I come to you, but I can't. And then allow God to do the work. Remember, Jesus told Satan, oh, try again, <laughs> Jesus told Peter that Satan demanded to sift him like wheat. But Jesus prayed for him that his faith wouldn't fail. And you know what? Right now, Jesus is praying for you and for me that our faith would not fail. Do you feel like your life is a mess and you can't see how God can bring anything good from this? Your mess today can become a ministry for others. Satan wouldn't have asked for to sift Peter if he didn't see Peter as a threat. And you're under attack because Satan doesn't want you to reach your full potential. He wants you to doubt God's promises. Let's not listen to him. He's a deceiver and he's the father of lies. Let's quickly look at Peter again. Before God used him to lead the church, he allowed Peter to be tested by Satan. Why? If Peter didn't fail, he might have been tempted to rely on his own abilities instead of realizing how much he needs Jesus. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, he told his disciples, that another comforter that would come, who would be with them, strengthen them, and remind them of all his words. Peter knew he was weak, and he needed to, to rely on this comforter, Holy Spirit. Peter said he would never deny Jesus. Yet, by the time the rooster crow crowed, he has done it not once, not twice, Three times. Can you relate? Have you promised not to lose your temper again? But you did. Cock a doodle doo. Have you promised not to give in to temptation again? But you did. Cock a doodle doo. Have you promised not to gossip again? But then the words came out of your mouth. cock a doo doo, -doo. When does the rooster crow? Early in the morning. Announcing a brand new day. After his worst night's failure, the sun came out for Peter again. And it will for us too. By God's amazing grace, we can start over any day we choose to. While we still have breath in our lungs. But there will be a day when it will be too late. Don't put it off. Turn to God today. Don't wait a minute longer 
No matter how badly we have failed, God will forgive us, restore us, and redirect our steps. What are we waiting for? The Bible tells us that God loves us. He knows us. He knows how many hairs are on our heads. He knows when we lie down and he knows when we wake up. He has called each one of us by name and we belong to him. He wants to use us in his kingdom. What will we answer today?